God's word. After he, that is, Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it, just say this, the Lord needs it. And so those who were sent departed, and they found it as he had told them. As they were untying it, the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord needs it. And then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the ground. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes uh, in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. Jesus replied, I tell you, if these were silent, well, even the stones would shout out. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave within you one stone upon another, because you do not recognize the time of your visitation from God. Here is the reading of God's Word. May God add a blessing to it. Well, maybe you heard the story about this family that had uh, recently begun to go to church. And that there was a little boy in this family, and he really enjoyed um, coming to worship. But one day, it so happened it was Palm Sunday, he got sick and he couldn't go to church. And so the boy stayed home with his father while the mother and the child's other siblings went on to worship. When mom came back with the siblings, they, uh, as often is the case, they had their, their palm fronds, their branches of palm trees. And the, the little boy was curious about this, and he said, well, tell me what the branches are for. And the Lord explained that when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, they waved um, these branches. And the little boy just got all upset, and he said, I can't believe it. He says, the one day that I don't go to church, Jesus shows up, and they have donkey rides. <laughs> well, I can't promise you donkey rides this morning, but I can promise you that Jesus will show up. So let's pray briefly if we can. Gracious God, as we come before you on the beginning of this most holy week, we ask you to reveal your truth to us during this time. Amen. Amen. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That is what we promise to bear witness to when we are in a court of law. And as I was studying this passage, it occurred to me that the story of Palm Sunday is kind of a, a case study, or perhaps a drama, if you prefer, in the truth, and how different groups respond to or don't respond to the truth of who they are, of their lives, and of who Jesus himself is. As we go through these different groups, I want to ask you to, to put yourself in their place and see if perhaps you see a little bit of yourself in these different groups. The first group is the disciples. For quite some time now, Jesus had been telling the disciples that he was going to be going to Jerusalem, that he would be handed over to the religious authorities, that he would suffer, and that he would be crucified, and that he would indeed raise from the dead. Several times he had taken them aside, and he had shared this sobering truth with them. But his disciples wouldn't or couldn't 
hear this truth. And there's something in here for us, isn't there? None of us wants to face the hard truth that our lives are going to involve pain and suffering, do we? We'll do almost anything, in fact, to avoid this profound but painful reality. That's why the first step of grieving is almost always denial, right? Oh, this is not happening to me. It's not happening whatsoever. I want you to think about dating. Now, for some of us, we're right in the middle of that, some of you teenagers. Others of us, it's been a little bit since we've been dating, but I want you to think back to when you were dating, and you were in love, and you were going out with somebody, and yet it often seems that the person, that we're the last person to know that our relationship is doomed. Have you ever noticed that about when you've been in love, that you're the last person to know? Your friends have been telling you for weeks and weeks, that it's over. I mean, your, your hound dog is howling in Heartbreak Motel every night. Your beloved is giving you little clues, saying things like, you know, are you dating anybody else, changing the locks, things like that. And yet, we don't hear this, do we? We just don't see this. We're too in love with the idea of being in love. We don't want to suffer. We don't see the hard truth, usually, until it hits us on the upside like a two-by-four. Whether that's a relationship that's dying, or perhaps a family dynamic with our children that maybe everybody else can see, but we're having a hard time coming to grips with, or a financial situation that's going south, or a, a health issue, or some other hard decision that we have to make but that we don't want to make, whatever it is, we usually don't like facing hard truths. In our denial, always has dire consequences, not only for ourselves, but for those around us as we continue to put off and put off dealing with the truth about ourselves. And yet here in this text, Jesus models a way to deal with the hard truth. As he rides into Jerusalem, he is painfully aware that he is most likely riding into his certain death. As he weeps over Jerusalem, I have no doubts that he is also weeping over his own impending death. Jesus can see the writing on the wall. He knows what it means to have a big parade on Holy Week in Jerusalem with people shouting basically political slogans. He knows what's going to happen here. And yet he continues to ride on courageously. How? How is it that Jesus gathered the courage, the bravery, to face the hard truth about his life. I'm reminded of a boarding school that had one dreamy child who was always doing kind of goofy or weird kinds of things, falling out of line to watch a butterfly, or stopping to let ants pass, or laying in the grass to watch the clouds pass by, and so forth. And as you can imagine, this kind of drove her instructors at the school a bit crazy. And one of them, her main instructor, was often looking for a reason to try to get rid of this child because he was so much trouble. One day, the instructor saw the girl placing little tissue papers up in a tree. And the wind was coming and was catching these tissues. And they were blowing throughout the whole community, throughout the town. And this was the last straw. This this instructor grabbed the little girl and the tissue paper evidence and marched her off into the headmistress's office, demanding that she be dismissed from the school. The headmistress opened up the evidence and found that the tissue papers had been carefully cut into little hearts. And on each one were carefully lettered the words, To whoever finds this, I love you. To whoever finds this, I love you. How did Jesus face the hard truth? He did it because his love for you and for me was greater than his fear of suffering. Perfect love casts out fear, we read in 1 John 4, 18. Now, of course, none of us loves perfectly, but each of us, if we're in relationship with Jesus, does have perfect love within our hearts. That's Jesus within us. And that love, that love of Christ is greater than our fears, even our fears of suffering. And if we will turn inward, if we will pray, if we will become aware, 
and we too can face the hard truth of our lives and pay whatever the price is that love demands. But there's a second group in our Palm Sunday drama, and that is the crowd. The crowd. This is one seriously gung-ho, excitable group of people, is it not? These guys are really happy. As Jesus rides into town, they throw their cloaks down before him, and they shout out, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. These people think that Jesus is the greatest thing since sliced toast. And yet, in five short days, they will completely change their tune about Jesus. Fickle crowd. Napoleon Bonaparte was once riding through Switzerland with his army, and he was greeted with thunderous applause and incredible enthusiasm from all of the people they were greeting him. One of his supporters came to Bonaparte and said, Oh, it must be so great to be receiving so many accolades, so much enthusiastic support from the crowd. Bah! said Bonaparte. This same unthinking crowd, he said, under slightly different circumstances, would just as easy, easily follow me to the gallows. And that is exactly what happened to Jesus of Nazareth. This same crowd who today cried, Hosanna in the highest, cried crucify him just this coming Friday. Jesus is king, they shouted out, but they only wanted the half-truth of his kingship. And so when they found out that Jesus came primarily to change their hearts, not to change their government as they were hoping he was going to do, they dropped away from him and turned on him. Content with only half-truth discipleship, when it became clear that Jesus demanded more than a feel-good parade and a couple peppy, upbeat praise choruses, they turned away from him. And I imagine that if we were honest, we'd probably find a little bit of the crowd in ourselves also, wouldn't we? A lot of us love a parade. I love a parade. I love a big church event. I love something that's going great and it's a lot of fun. That's a great time. And yet, uh, it's a little harder for me sometimes when it's a church work day or when it's a committee meeting to garner quite the same enthusiasm that I do for something that's big and fun and exciting. We're all for church, aren't we? As long as we get to kind of pick and choose in a religious smorgasbord that other people have prepared for us. There's more of that in me than I would care to admit, I'm afraid. But just as the Lord had need of the donkey in our story, so he invites his followers to a life of deeper discipleship, to a life of humble service, not only grateful praise. Serving Christ is not our burden to bear, rather it's our privilege to share to share the gospel, the good news with those around us in word and in deed. And so Jesus bids us to a deeper life of discipleship. But there's a third party in our Palm Sunday drama, and that is the Pharisees. If the disciples' problem is that they won't accept the hard truth, and the crowd's problem is that they're clinging to half-truths, the Pharisees' problem is that they believe that they've got the whole truth. You ever met people who think that they have the whole truth about pretty much everything? You'll find them in all kinds of different circles. You can find conservatives who are like this. You can find liberals who can like this. You can find people all across the political spectrum who think that they've got the whole truth. They're haughty and they're arrogant. And usually they're so serious about themselves that they want to put the kibosh on anybody else who doesn't live up to their so-called standards of sophistication. And so the Pharisees try to tell Jesus to order his disciples to be quiet 
to stop all of this silly hoopla immediately. They know what the truth is, they think. And it certainly isn't Jesus, and it's not worth getting all this excited about. I think Jesus weeps for the Pharisees. Because he can see there's destruction coming. Because he says you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. And that's it in a nutshell, I believe. People who think that they've got the whole truth can never recognize God's gifts in other people because their worldview is just so tightly packaged, so neatly put together, that there's no room for other people and for their gifts. And again, I imagine there's a lot of Pharisees in each of us. How many times, for instance, is your adult seriousness, I'm talking primarily to the adults, but teenagers don't think you're beyond this, how many times has your adult seriousness closed you off, prevented you from seeing God's gifts that He wanted to give you and those around you? I recently heard about a mother, for instance, who had one of those days where she just had done, I'm looking at a cat over here, she had just done the mommy thing really well that day. She took her children to the park. She read a whole bunch of stories to them. When they spilled their milk, she didn't get all upset. And she just was feeling really good about her mommy effort that day. And so she patted herself on the back. And as soon as Dad got home, she kind of cordoned herself off in a quiet room with her book and said, Ah, I am all done. This is now mommy time. Mommy time. And then this little voice. Oh, oh. You've been there. This little boy is called out from down below in the basement. It was her seven-year-old son, Tommy. And so she did what parents often do when they're trying to have a little time. They ignore She ignored the voice. You're, you've been there. Sometimes they go away, don't they? Sometimes things get resolved. The child can't find you. But rarely, no. Parents say no, not usually. But she hopes. And indeed, the voice persisted. Mom, come down to the basement, would you? I want to show you something. Oh, honey, I'm really tired. Why don't you bring it up here? I can't bring it up here, said the little voice. Oh, sure you can, Tommy. Just, just bring it on up the stairs. I'm right here. I can't, Mommy. It's too heavy. Oh, Tommy... I really don't want to come down the stairs right now. I'll see it later. But, Mommy, I need you to see this now. By this time, Mother's anger was starting to kick in. And she went to the top of the stairs, and she looked down harshly. And she said, Tommy, I do not want to come downstairs. I will do it later. I really want you to see it now. And so she stormed down the stairs and she snapped, What do you want? I'm busy. And there she saw her son with big crocodile tears in his eyes. And behind him was the old cathode ray tube screen of the computer. And the child had carefully created, out of individual small letters, the simple sentence that says, I love mom. And the woman's heart was broken. How often, I wonder, how often do we get so wrapped up in our adult seriousness, our busyness, our take on the truth, that we forget the truth that others bring to us? How often do we miss our visitation from God? God is indeed visiting the earth all of the time. That is one of the messages of Scripture. Emmanuel, God with us. And so Jesus bids us to loosen our grip on our life a little bit, to allow other people in and to join the party, to join the praise. If these stones were silent, says Jesus, even they would sing out. So what's the true meaning of Palm Sunday? Well, it's all about the truth. The hard truths that we don't want to face, the half-truths that we cling to, and the joyful truths that we're too arrogant to see. 
And so we ask that Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life, that he will come and that he will invade our lives. Let's pray. Dear Lord, from the cowardice that dares not face the hard truth, from the laziness that's content with half-truth, from the arrogance that thinks it knows all truth, dear God, we ask that you might deliver us. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand for our closing song.